Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. In this episode, we talk to Brian Kurtz, Executive Vice President at Boardroom Inc., which at its height hit $150 million. He's overseen the mailing of approximately 1.3 billion pieces of direct mail over the past 30 years. So he's going to talk about what works, what doesn't work. He knows a thing or two about marketing, copywriting, and what makes him one of the world's greatest list managers. Thanks, Brian, so much for being here. Oh, thanks. And it's funny. I love the fact that we're going to talk about my list management business, which was like the first 10 years of my business. And I haven't talked a lot about it. And when we were talking, preparing for this, I realized that your audience being a lot of salespeople, a lot of entrepreneurs, I think they might get a lot out of this because lists and audiences and all of that, I think, is very uh, salient to what they're probably doing today. And then as far as the numbers you, you called out, we, we said this before the interview started, that it's a great way for me to get in the door, so maybe they'll stay listening for the whole interview now, because they'll say, maybe this guy knows something. Maybe they'll say that he killed too many trees with his 1.3 billion pieces of direct mail. But I think the, the key thing is that I really understand uh, connection, contribution, you know, how that works, um, you know, in, in marketing, and I don't like to necessarily brag. I mean, it's not bragging if you've done it, but I don't really like to be defined by numbers. For sure. I, I think my legacy is going to be much more about um, bringing together different um, generations of marketers uh, as I go to this next 30-year career. Right. And we were talking uh, about leaving that legacy and all these direct marketing principles that you use with, you know, bringing to people so they can use it on the internet or do traditional direct mail or whatever they need exactly. to, or just the principles in copywriting communication is huge. Because you know, we get a lot of people and comments from people who have, they have tons of ideas, they don't know where to start, or they have a product or service and they're trying to get traction with sales and growing. So you're a perfect person, especially being going through 1.3 billion you know, pieces of direct mail, you learn, learn a finger, thing or two, yeah, right? Well, I, I won't say I licked every stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And I always like to include a fun fact. A fun fact about you, Brian, is you're an umpire extraordinaire. So when you're not looking through direct mail, you can find you can find you in little league fields, right? Well, I I, I just I, it's interesting. We'll maybe I'll well at the end maybe we'll talk about some of the most the toughest calls and or my highlight. But the interesting thing about umpiring is that um, pe there are a lot of guys I umpire with that it's like it's like when you join a co-op board because you have no power in your life. So you become an umpire so I can, you know, <laughs> you know and I didn't, I didn't become an umpire because of that. I became an umpire because I love the focus and I love the fact that when I leave the office, I, I do Varsity High School and I do very high level Little League. So my goal, my... Yeah, I saw a Little League World Series. I, I saw did that. a Little League World yeah. Series in South Carolina, which is the big league division, 16 to 18 year old. Mm -hmm. My goal is to get to Williamsport, which is kind of the pinnacle of Little League baseball. 12. It's so interesting. The 12 year olds have more status than the 18 year olds in Little that League. That is weird. Yeah. It is weird, but that that's my goal to get there. But I've already done an Eastern Regional for the 12 year olds, so I'm on my way. But the interesting thing is um, that I wanted to share with your audience on that particular point about focus is that. When I'm at the office for a full day and I do high school varsity baseball, which is also very tense. I mean, you know, there are high school coaches that parents are... Parents are crazy, too. Yeah, par well, actually, in, in high school, the coaches are worse. Oh, okay. I mean, in Little League, yeah, the parents are crazy. Um, but in, in high school, the coaches are all kind of wannabes because they want to be college coaches or they probably want it to be Tommy Lasorda or something or Earl Weaver. So they're tough. You miss a call, you're going to get beat up. Right. And so I have to leave the office after a full day of licking stamps in direct marketing and, and doing online and whatever. And I go to a game and now I'm behind home plate and I'm probably calling, what, 200, 300 pitches. And every single one, I have to be so focused that I have to leave everything back at the office. And it's one of the best things for me. I, I will tell you that, and everybody's got to have this in their life, right? right? It's whether you do yoga, and mine is tougher because in yoga, if you don't have the right position, I don't think you're going to get yelled at the way I probably get yelled at if I miss a pitch. So it's, it's the pressure of, of, of knowing that if I miss one, I'm going to get yelled at. I love that. Um, and then the fact that if I don't, if I walk out off the field and they say, nice game, um, I'm so satisfied. And then at night, I always find the days that I umpire at night when I go back on my email because I had to leave early and I start doing some work, the focus is like intensified because mm. I, I spent those two or three hours on a completely you have to be hyper-focused for that. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think everybody has that in their life. And I think 
you know, I think any entrepreneur who's also a shiny object person like I am, you know, I'm a nine, I'm a nine quick start in Colby. I mean, I'm, I'm off, you know, I'm not a good follow through guy. I'm a, I'm an idea guy and I'm sure you are too. And so, uh, although you have to, being a doctor, you have to follow through on a lot of stuff too. So you have to have both, I think. You're probably a mix. Um, but you have to find really, your focus. You got to yeah. find your focus. You really do. You really and do. I want to go back, you know, talking about Little League, I want to go back to your childhood a little bit and what influenced you. What was an, who was an inspiration for you early on? Yeah, you know, I, I have so many mentors in the marketing world. That's usually the question. So I really appreciate the question because it's rare that people want to go back further than the beginning of your work life. And I've had some of the best mentors. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think I, it all stems in how we develop can come from those early days. The early days. So, yeah. So I thought about that. And, and um, there were two. I mean, obviously my dad, my dad was a, an elementary school principal, um, started as a teacher. And then I realized, I said, all right, my dad influenced me. I mean, I remember, you know, he was a principal of the largest elementary school in the Bronx, which is a borough of New York City, largest elementary school in New York City at one point, had like 2,700 students in wow. elementary school. So that's leadership, right? That's, you know, and he also was great in, in front of a crowd. He, he made me realize that I never should be afraid to do public speaking. And now, of course, he'd be very proud of me. He, he passed away, but he'd be very proud Sorry, of me yeah. that I'm doing podcasts now too. So what um, was something he taught you with leadership or what did you see him do that struck I you? I saw him, um, you know, he had to bring together such disparate people. I mean, he had, you know, teachers at an elementary school in the Bronx in the 1960s and 70s. You can imagine that there are people coming from all different areas of, of, of race, many, socioeconomic. Exactly. And he brought all of them together. And, and certainly the student body in the Bronx, it was in the South Bronx, was not, was a very low socioeconomic group. And so the ability to, you know, be able to let that staff understand that they had a bigger mission. And so maybe I took that, I'm not dealing with, you know, inner city youth as I'm teaching direct marketing right. today. But I think that there's a great lesson there in saying, you know, not everybody came from the same background. Not everybody had the same privileges as me. I mean, you, you had said, you know, what, how did you pull, you know, most entrepreneur, entrepreneurial interviews says, how did you pull yourself up from the bootstraps? You know, I have to admit, I did not grow up in squalor. I was fairly, I was lower middle class growing up, but I, when I, even my first jobs, I mean, I had a job. I didn't have to like bootstrap anything. And I became a very entrepreneurial, like, I had an entrepreneurial mindset at a young age because I also didn't want to be a public servant either. I mean, I saw, I saw my dad being a school teacher. And then I had this one uncle who, was a real entrepreneur. I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was when I was growing up. This is like late That's 60s. why I asked because where does yeah. it come from? But I, I think that he, um, this, my, this is my Uncle Nat, and my Uncle Nat had a, he just like started companies. He had, he started, he had a vacuum cleaner company called Compaq in New Jersey before, you know, vacuum cleaners were, you know, were mostly door-to-door -door salesmen. And he figured out how to distribute in a bigger way. Then he did bidets, you know, cleaning yourself, uh, right. the, the French bidet, exactly. And he actually kind of mass marketed bidets. And then he did um, burglar and fire alarms way before they were all that popular when actually the world was a safer place. So looking at somebody who was trying to get ahead of the curve and also they were commodities, right? So, you know, I think of, you know, I, when I think about my business now every single day when we're doing new product development the difference between commodity and specialty is just so critical and when you can either find a specialty product I mean that's always great like mm -hmm. bottom line personal our newsletter is specialty in that there's no other newsletter that's exactly like it but then when you could take a commodity like I, I saw recently a weight loss supplement where the marketers had created what I considered specialty from commodity because of how they did the research, the kinds of ingredients, then they did double blind studies. They did things that no one else in the weight loss supplement business were doing. So then they just created a, a, a specialty from a commodity. That's a, that's a simple example. But to me, that is some of the that's the secret sauce in new product development. So what did it's they do? Either, what did you see they did right and wrong with that? Or, or maybe they didn't do something wrong with that special, with the supplement. You know what it was? It was patience. Uh, if I had to use one word, um, it was patience and not being greedy, which is a big theme for me also. Because I think, especially as online marketers, 
um, especially because it's so cheap to market, as we mentioned, I think that um, there's a tendency to get you can get out there fast, you can get out there with almost anything, and you could probably make some money. And the fact is, if you play the game for the long haul, which I always had to do in direct mail, I have an expression that a dollar per thousand marketing deserves five hundred dollar per thousand thinking. A dollar per thousand meaning what it costs to send an email approximately or, the, or less. Right. And five hundred dollars per thousand, which is what it costs to do a direct mail campaign. And if you spend the time thinking about it, the long-term effects and the lifetime value, which is a key concept also, the lifetime value of a customer is key. And, and so what these guys did in particular, and I see some people on the Internet doing this, so it's not like everybody's not doing, not, not doing the right things, is that they understood that getting that first purchase was not the trick. It was getting the lifetime customer, getting people to stay with you for a long period of time, the relationship. You know, the best people who do launches online today are the ones that are usually the heart-based entrepreneurs that believe in a product in a big way, and then they give away a ton of content and a ton of information because they need to get that message out, and they create a tribe just like you and I are doing you know, with our, you know, with the people that we want to surround ourselves with. Right. And it's not about hitting them up for an offer as quickly as possible right. just because it's cheap to do so. Right. And so that's a broad answer to a very specific question, but it's so critical. And so it's, I remember my, Marty, my mentor who started this company and just passed away yeah. uh, in Sorry October. To hear that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it, it was, it was tough for me, but I'm so inspired by him. And I remember sitting at a meeting. He was never impolite, but he always called, he called the moose on the table, right? He was the kind of guy, he had an expression, the only things worth talking about are the things you can't talk about. And so, and, and in business as well as personal, it's, it's basically getting to the crux. So I remember one time that there was a, a company we were doing business with, and they were very important to us. They were doing all of our fulfillment for our subscriptions, and they kept on acquiring companies. And their core business was suffering because they were, out there doing things that they weren't they're they weren't stretched focusing. out it's really stretched yeah. out and so i remember marty at a lunch we we're at the rainbow room in new york great restaurant and marty looks at the guy and he goes why are you guys being such pigs <laughs> and he said it like not in a nasty way right but he wanted to say to them look you know we went to you because you were really good at this and now you're trying to be this so again let's go back to your original question using that weight loss supplement as the example but it could be anything you know, be great at this. You know, Dick Benson, who's one of the great direct mail consultants of all time, one time I, I used to go visit him. You go visit Dick. Uh, it was like the, the mountain went to visit him, right? <laughs> he just sat in his office, and you would spend the day with him, and I would bring every direct mail test we were doing. Um, he's just, he was probably the smartest guy about direct mail that ever lived, in my opinion. In fact, we republished his book. It's called Secrets of Successful Direct Mail. And um, I remember after about my fourth or fifth visit to spending a full day with him down in, in Amelia Island in, in, uh, in uh, Georgia or Florida. One's Amelia Island, one's, one's uh, Skidaway Island. So he always would be on an island off the coast of Georgia or Florida. And I'd spend the day, and, I, and at the end of the, one of those days, I said, Dick, how did you get so smart? And he says, I, he took, his, he took his, uh, his thumb and his index finger, put it an inch apart. He knows it. I know everything about this much. And it just, like, blew me away. It was like, you know... There are some people that want to know everything about this much, and if you can't see me, you know, my arms are spread too wide. And there are some people who could do that. You know, there are people in the world that are like that. But the average person, you know, if they know everything about this much, you know, the, the three inches, they're going to be such powerful human beings yeah. in there. And it's, it's – maybe, maybe I'm just doing a long explanation. I know what you of mean. It's marketing, you know. Yeah, or, I mean it takes a lot of discipline to do that because – it does. We kind of see this, oh, well, I could try this and I could try this, but really focusing in on what we're best at is sometimes hard to do, Very I think. Um, and what was, so what was, you were talking about Marty and some of the things, he liked to talk about the things that weren't talked about. What were other things that weren't talked about that he brought up? Wow. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you a story that has, doesn't have to do about marketing, but there's a great lesson. So, okay. so <laughs> he told this story. Uh, once I, I think I told it during his funeral. As a matter of fact, wow. there's a guy. He's walking. He's wa He's walking. Um, Marty's walking in the street, and there's a guy walking in, in Midtown Manhattan, crowded Fifth Avenue. And there's a guy, and his head is like this, 
and he's just like walking around like this with his head completely like twisted. And everybody's sort of staring at the guy. And Marty goes up to him and says, <laughs> you know, asks him like, why is, you know, why is your, you know, why? And he, and he started talking about, and he got the guy to stop to talk to him. And he started talking about this nerve disorder. And all of a sudden, Marty ended up with a story idea that it was actually something that I think was preventable or something. Whatever it was, it turned into Marty's curiosity leading to incredible education only because he asked the question. There's another one that I told um, just recently because I did a, I have a PowerPoint presentation now that I actually built from the eulogy that I did. I never uh-huh. thought about it when I was doing the eulogy that yeah. I need to get these lessons out. Marty's lessons are just unbelievable. Um, but Marty um, was, was so in tune to making sure that, um, that the story, you know, every story got told. So he was reading the paper one day um, he lived in New Jersey, and he's he's reading about this woman named Kelly Michaels, who um, was a school teacher in um, New Jersey, who was put in jail for molesting I don't know kindergarten students or something. Oh, wow. and, you know, it was a really ba- it was a it was a big case at the time. Yeah. And he's reading the newspaper, and he's reading a little bit about her background, and he's reading about how the testimony of the kids was the key, and blah blah blah. And these are like you know five year olds. Right. And Marty says something here doesn't make sense to me. So he calls up on his own time, his own dime, you know, a journalist from Vanity Fair magazine that he knew. And he says, Dorothy Rabinowitz, look into this for me. Just look into this for me. And uh, long story short, not only was the whole thing like a ridiculous uh, uh, witch hunt that they did use kids who were coerced to uh, testify against Kelly – uh, so not only was she eventually uh, released from jail, I don't know how long she spent in jail. It could have been, it could have been the mo- more than a, f- a couple of years. Oh wow! And then the end of the story is that at, um, we got a letter after Marty's funeral from her husband with a picture of her seven children, talking about basically, you know, without him, it, it, it's a choked up kind of story, yes. but without him. These se- it's like a George Bailey story, right? It's like it's a wonderful life. These seven kids never would have been born. And wow. so and she'd be rotting in jail. Wow. And, and how did that happen? Oh, I'm reading the newspaper. That doesn't make sense. So having insatiable curiosity is such an amazing trait in a human being. I mean, I don't even have that. I mean, I have, I have a lot. I, I have pretty good cu- curiosity. If you I'm look not- through 1.3 billion of uh, any anyone who does that has to have the attention and the curiosity to to keep making yeah, changes. Yeah, I don't have his. Like I mean, that. he was an extraordinary. I mean, he was at. You know, there are just certain people that are just. You know, the bar is so high, and I don't know. I, I'll never be him, and I don't try to be him. Right. But what an example, right? I mean, you know, and and saving lives everywhere you can. You know, and you can save lives. You know, now now I'll sound like you know oh. That's the marketer, and you know, I'm gonna say, I was gonna say, you can save lives through great direct mail, and you can save lives through great internet marketing, but you can. It depends what your what your products are, and your products happen to be a lot of health products. Um, I mean, was that always the case, or did you shift to more health products? You know, that's a good point. I mean, we definitely went where the market was going. When Marty started the company, the reason why it's called Boardroom is that the first product was called Boardroom Reports, which was a business newsletter. Mm-hmm. Um, and because Marty was a voracious reader of business books and didn't like what was in the magazines that were out there. Business Week, Fortune, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, they didn't tell you how to run a business. They just told you what was happening at the big businesses. Right. So he said, I want to teach people how to run a business. So he started Boardroom Reports for that reason. And then what happened was he, he launched Bottom Line Personal because he wanted the executive to have all that same inside information for their personal life. And then Marty, being the smart marketer that he is, he saw where the puck was going, not where it was, the Wayne Gretzky quote. And he said, I want to go consumer, not business, because that's where I can definitely make a bigger difference, I think. The business people were harder to find list-wise. It was a much more difficult marketplace. Mm-hmm. And now, of course, with you know home businesses and stuff and how on the entrepreneurial environment, you can see that's a tougher market to market to, whereas the consumer market was wide open for him. Mm-hmm. And then the health stuff just lent itself. Then we, then we launched the health newsletter. And even though bottom line personal is health and finance and everything, health became the crux of that. And then the database started just moving toward that way. And then we started then buying the rights to health books and creating health books. So we kind of kept going where the puck was going. 
and I think this is a good lesson too from you know from my background in the list business that you know sometimes you you should let your market talk to you and kind of tell you where to go sometimes and not be stubborn you know Marty could have been stubborn and he, and we were a little bit I mean we we probably hung on to board reports longer than we should have um, but the but the blood the, and here's a, here's a good good lesson about branding. So we build this database then, right, with Bottom Line Personal now getting up to a million subscribers. Boardroom Reports is sitting at about 150,000. And then all of a sudden, Boardroom Reports isn't profitable. And we say, Bri we'll, we'll try one more mailing. And we'll change the name of Boardroom Reports to Bottom Line Business. And don't you know we got like 130% lift in direct mail just by changing the title? Because the whole database, our house file, now was branded to the term bottom line from bottom line personal. And there was so, so now we more. went full circle and said, if you're in business, bottom line personal brings you bottom line business. Oh, they didn't even know what Boardroom Reports was. And that gave Boardroom Reports like another two years of life as bottom line business. But that's a good lesson. A, a, a good friend of mine, Michael Fishman, has a quote. He was a list guy too back in the 80s. And Michael used to say, it's, you know, brand, he doesn't like, we, we hate the term branding in direct marketing. Because branding means you're going to spend a lot of money on advertising. Right. It doesn't pay out. <laughs> right. But what Michael used to say is like, know how known or unknown your brand is. So we all have a brand, right? Brian Kurtz has a brand. Jeremy has – we all have brands. Bottom line had a brand. It wasn't well known in big consumer circles. It was well known in this tighter circle. Right. And so within that circle, within that database – the bottom line brand when we started putting it on the spine of books called bottom line books and putting it on another newsletter called bottom line business and another newsletter called bottom line health holy moly now we just created a brand within the database that you know right so just really so you're doing you know, both in a sense you're getting that direct response but you're also building the brand as you're you're doing the direct response because you correct. have just a sure volume of you know pieces you're sending out that's right um that's and i want to hear about the list management side but how do you even begin to – how do you get, build up a list of a million people? I mean because you have to have a list to manage. Yeah. So a big breakthrough for us um, back then, this is in the 1980s, was, is, is um, going from a cash offer to, to a bill me offer. And, and I'm going to bring this into the present too because I think your, your folks really want to hear this. And it's actually a pet project of mine. Um, in the bigger and better world of, of online marketing. But in the offline world, if you could somehow um, go from a cash offer, when I say a cash offer, meaning you have to put your credit card in up front, which is what the Internet's about today, almost 100%. Right. So you're not going to give somebody a product site on scene, whether it's digital or physical. Um, and so early on, because of cash flow issues, we and we didn't want to send books in the mail. And it's expensive. Newsletters. It's very expensive. So we had to get the cash up front. And then so finally we started – develop. we had enough cash flow that we were able to test the bill me offer. And once you start doing a bill me offer, meaning that I'm going to give you something on a trial basis or I'm going to give it to you free for a 30-day trial period if it's a book, for example. On a newsletter, you can give them three free issues or six free issues. Um, this is how the whole magazine business was built. And that's why magazines get up to such a high circulation. Um, so your question, though, how do you get to a million? Well, Better Homes and Gardens got to, what, 10 million or Ladies Home Journal, whatever. But they have advertising in the magazine. So the idea of getting to those numbers, they have something else that pays the bills, not just the mailing to get there. So direct right. mail is the reason they got there because direct mail, nothing scales like direct mail. You get high response rates and you still do compared to the Internet and other media. But with us, we didn't even have advertising in our newsletters. So we had to make money on the circulation itself. Right. So there, when we went to a bill me offer, the ability in direct mail to not send to names in advance that you know might not pay you, you could understand how valuable that might be. It's huge, so we yeah. call it credit screening. And credit screening was sort of – it's like human nature. It was like standard operating procedure for us in direct mail because I didn't want to spend – two, three, four, five hundred dollars per thousand in the mail, send it to people who are either going to rip me off or are never going to pay, right? How do they so, respond to that? Do they respond with a, just an address? Do they have to respond with a credit card or something? Or No, no, no. I, well, what I do is I don't even mail. I suppress those names before I even mail them. If I know that I have a credit screen that I have people who already know that are on a bad debt file. 
They're I mean, if, great. if they're on a good, I mean, if they're on, in good standing and they order it, what happens? Okay, so if they're in good standing enough for us to mail them, then they, in our case, the best response mechanism was always a reply card as opposed to an 800 number. And certainly later we tried to get them to go to the Internet, which they don't. And these are older people too. But the way that the order card works, since it's a bill me offer, now they don't have to fill anything out because there's no credit card to fill out. And, so, and then the order card is already pre-printed with their name and address, which is part of the addressing procedure that you do in direct mail. So all they have to do is take that card, rip it out of the direct mail piece, and throw it in the mailbox. Um, in most cases, we don't even make them put a stamp on it. That's testable, by the way. If you make them put a stamp on it, you get a better quality person, but you also don't get any, as many names up front, right. and then you have to test that and see if it pays out. But yeah. the idea that, that they're going to respond through direct mail from direct mail is pretty cool. And so the interesting thing, let me bring it to the present day for a moment. I think that there's an incredible opportunity online that if we could figure out how to sell product online with a bill me offer with credit screening up front so that the offer goes out on a display ad, for example, and it says subject to, you know, um, um, uh, subject to you know qual subject to qualification or something and so they hit they hit order and in real time because if you'll have a credit screen database on the back end you'll know whether to send them to a page where you have to get their credit card or a page where you won't I'm oversimplifying this I'm not a statistician and yeah. I'm not a but I could see this being a game changer yeah and it's starting to take place a little bit and I know some people who are working on this in online and I think that you know the online folks have never felt good about sending product in the mail, especially if it's physical product, digital product too, right. without getting paid for it up front. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's something someone would have to test, but I'm curious if you, you know, because a lot of people you see, they do a $1 trial because then they have the credit card and they can rebuild it as opposed to here it is. I don't think right. I've, I've seen that. Yeah. And I you think know. getting the credit card and then, you know, you have to have a, 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 a the contract copy has got to be fairly large to say that you know, we're only going to bill you for the dollar, but if you don't return it in 30 days, we're going to hit your credit card. Right. I got to tell you, the government's got their eye on all of that. Right. So if you cut corners on that kind of an offer at all, you know, seller beware. I mean, internet marketer beware. Direct mail person beware. If you don't tell you tell the prospect up front in all of the right disclosures that they're going to get hit on their credit card on a regular basis, you know, you you have to be very very careful with that yeah i mean even with you have to know to the t if these people have good credit because if you're selling a physical or sending them a physical product and they haven't paid yet so what were some other things um i know you talked about some lessons with being one of the best list managers what was another lesson that you learned that you bring to the business and copy and everything yeah i think that you know my my 10 years or so that i was um a list manager one of marty's other um expressions is, you know, you only go through life once, you might as well be the world's best. Right. And so I was focused on, on being, you know, in fact, one of the pinnacles of my career, I thought my career was over in 1987 when Dick Benson, after my third or fourth visit, he used to say no one spends enough time on lists. And after a day of with me, he said, Brian, you know, no one really spends enough time on lists, but you really know the list business and I'm really impressed. And I said, Dick, can I die now? Because <laughs> you know, I'm done, you know. Dick Benson just told me that I'm like his it's a high compliment. Yes, uh, high compliment, and and it's because that I understood that understanding the list business was just so important to everything that we did. Now, I think with the with the benefit of 32 years behind me now, I will tell you that I think creative execution might be more important only because I feel like the list stuff. I take that, I don't take it for granted, but I understand lists well enough where finding great creative talent is harder for me than being able to ask questions about lists. But it's because I spent 10 years really focused on... Um, creative talent, uh, you mean copywriting? Copywriting and, and creative, okay. yeah. It's okay. much tougher to find great copywriters than great list brokers. But, but finding the right list for your audience is still a talent. Uh, for, for your offer is still a talent. Right. And so one of the lessons that I learned early on is that what happened was in the list business, and these are people who are selling response lists, not compiled lists, and I won't go into a whole lesson. I used to do a whole two-day session on, on, the, on just the list industry. And maybe as the, as the uh, benefit for the, um, the squeeze for after this interview, 
they, uh, we can send them to another interview that I did just on the on list mastery, which I did with Joe Polish, which is a really good interview. I was thinking that might be the best interview to give them because uh, I think your yeah folks, that was good. I, I did yeah, listen to that. So I think that's a good one for this audience because I think if you understand your list, and I think in online you don't have to understand it as much, or so they don't they think because again, as you said, it's so cheap to send email. Why do I have to yeah. worry so much about the list? But right. you do because every time you mail something to somebody you're possibly diminishing response for the next offer and you don't want to waste that on names that aren't going to ever respond anyway. What do you tell people now who are like, you know, I don't even want to, it's expensive, I don't know how to do it, I just want to stick to the email. What do you tell people of the importance of you know, finding a list and actually doing something physical? What do you tell them? I would probably tell them that, um, that I agree to, for the most part that to the, the high cost of entry for something like direct mail and for physical product might not be where you want to go if you were doing a startup kind of situation mm -hmm. but to ign but ignore it at your peril for the long term and what I what I mean by that is that I think that the the real secret of direct mail in the future is going to be on the back end of some big internet a, a big email business. So for instance, if the first product is a digital product and the second product is a digital product and now and I've got a higher price product and now I've got an audience of people who have paid me a thousand dollars instead right. of forty seven dollars, those people are people that they've moved gonna, through the funnel and so right, now you I know they're a better better uh, exactly. person to so send I should to. be able to spend more money on them. I should spend more money on them because they're they've already created a more of a lifetime value. Yeah. I, I, I'll give you a quick story. Yeah. Uh, a woman in in the internet business, great business. She's a wonderful marketer, and she once was showing me a printout of all of the people in uh, on her database, like all the different, um, um, uh, you know, all the people like. These these 150 people have bought five products from me, and these she had all laid out. It laid out like that. It was like a very a mini a mini database, and so at the bottom it said there was one person that bought 17 products from her. So my response to her, and I did it as a joke, but I wasn't really joking. I said, "So see that person there that bought 17 products from you? How often have they been to your house for dinner?" And then I used that as an opportunity yeah. to kind of. Um, explain that you know the that's a person that's like VIP right. on steroids right yeah. and that person should be getting you know personal mailings from you personal right. phone calls because right. this person's a guru, we do right? we do get stuck in that online world and we forget about there's like a that uh, that offline physical personal connection it's and, unbelievable and yeah. and and then the beauty of it is that that you can afford to spend more money on that person and that person would be someone who you'd want to hang around with if they bought 17 products from you. Chances are they're going to like you right. and that you're going to like them and they're going to be then maybe someone who could sell for you. I mean, I, I'll go on and on and on. I mean, it's so obvious to me. But the, actually, the big point I would make here is that a database of 9 million names, a database of 9,000 names, a database of 90 names, the Yes, when you have 9 million names like we have, not bragging, that's a real number, we have to do broad-based what we call regression modeling and analysis and all kinds of stuff. So you can't get into that one-on-one -on -one as much. And it's also a $39 product because it's mass market. But as you get in, it's almost like the, the segmentation that you have to think about or that you should think about is actually more important because you only have a few products to sell and they're very right. high price probably. And people should be treated akin to how they've treated you in terms of how much business they've given you. That's yeah. a division of, that's sort of a subgroup of database marketing that the average person would never think of. Um, and now the good direct, the good online marketers think about this. So I'm not one of, I tell you, I'm not one of those guys that like say all the internet marketers don't know anything and all those kids don't know what they're doing. That's not my game. Yeah. So, I mean, what would you, what have you seen, I guess, to be the biggest, uh, pitfalls or mistakes that people make that they should avoid that maybe you made early on or well, yeah I think right now I would I'll talk about right now I'll tell you about a couple of mine if you want but the the one that I see out there now is that and the way I the way I do it I think on a slide in a PowerPoint is sort of that uh, that it, con the confusion that a that a flashing box with an arrow is actually a, a state-of-the-art creative you know, that the idea of copy 
and and connection through copy and relationship uh, through copy and your audience is so is it's not a dying art. I mean, good people. There are a lot of people online writing great copy, but I think that I'd like to see. I think a lot of people make mistakes thinking that you know what it looks like. I mean, there's always that old story in direct mail that ugly sells. And I see it now online. You know, some of the best online marketers I know never send an HTML email, for instance. They always send text. There's a plain text email. Plain text is much more powerful in terms of... It looks like you get it from a friend. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that... So that's sort of like... There's one of many things that I see out there that kind of bugs me. Um, Mistakes, I've made... made, God, I've made so many mistakes. Um, I think that... um, I, I think... You know, the, my stubbornness in early on that I wanted our products to be sold on TV, and not because I ever wanted to be a TV star, but that I had this envy of, you know, all these magazines, be, and this is in the 80s when all the magazines were, you know, advertising on TV, and until I had the epiphany that selling, and this goes back to the branding thing, that Sports Illustrated can do a two-minute spot because everybody knows what Sports Illustrated is, and all that matters whether you're getting the the football phone or the or the I remember you know, that f- yeah right yeah um, whereas if I do a two minute on bottom line personal like what the hell is that I can't describe because so then I realized well if my direct mail is already sixteen page letters or twelve page letters that's not going to work in two minutes so I I realized in the late eighties the epiphany I had is that infomercials was going to be it and so I have a, a, a stuff on my on my uh, squeeze page about some of these case histories of, of how we got into the infomercial business in great detail. And um, that epiphany of the, mis- the mistake I was making is that falling in love with an idea to be on TV was not the idea. The idea was how my product mix was going to fit. And if that medium was going to yeah. fit, how was I going to do it? And of course, Tony Robbins solved my problem early on in terms of figuring out how we're going to sell information product on a 30 minute spot I still didn't fit. that was like late 80s I didn't get into the infomercial business until 2005 not that I'm a slow learner but I never figured out how to do it until I put all the pieces together that story actually So what was, was the first what was the first uh, information what did you put out there for the first infomercial um, the, the first infomercial we we what happened was I was watching TV late at night um, and this is one of my big lessons is that you always have to follow the anecdotal evidence in everything you do, like, and and there are models out there that are working, and you don't have to copy. This is not. This is stealing smart. This isn't just stealing. There's a big difference between stealing and stealing smart, by the way. And a lot of people. Or mo- like, we'll call it modeling, maybe. Yeah, we call yeah. it modeling, right? Yeah. Um, so I was watching TV late at night, and I had been. So this is like 2004, after since 1989, having Tony Robbins envy that we should be able to be on an infomercial with the bottom line way of life just like there's the Tony Robbins way of life but I never figured I had to do it with multiple product and we didn't have a guru we didn't have a brand I just never figured I had to do it and so I'm watching um, late night television and there's uh, Kevin Trudeau who some people know some people don't Mm -hmm. but a real pitchman on TV and he's selling one book on what they don't want you to know. It's a health book of some all, sort. I feel all this stuff is what they don't want you to know. But I know. That was our yeah. copy line back from the 80s. Yeah. So he was ripping us off, but that's okay. Uh, Kevin was a great pitchman. I didn't necessarily – it wasn't about the content he was, he was doing. But all of a sudden the epiphany was, oh, he can sell a single book. And then I, I called up the toll-free number, and I could have been on the phone for two hours on, on upsells and cross Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So then I realized what the model was. Then I said, how do I fit into that model? And so that's the story of, and so I said, I can come up with what's our best book. At the time, I thought our best book would be a a broad um, health book. And I I, I got together with a great creative direct response television guy. We brainstormed and we created this world's greatest treasury of health secrets. And it had all these doctors in it. And he came up with the idea that we're going to create this credibility that no one's ever seen in infomercials before. So our first show had like what we call Dr. Pods. Actually, our, sec- our first show didn't have the Dr. Pods. Our first show had um, an interview format, which was really good. The second show, we got Hugh Downs, legendary newscaster, interviewing a health writer, Arthur Johnson, and 
they used the Treasury of Health Secrets, and that show went off the charts. Wow. It was for we, we we once bought a million dollars worth of media in one week for that show. Holy cow! And and the key to it was that we put these doctor pods of doctors who were in the book, and they actually were filmed and said, you know, my study on Alzheimer's was was one of the land break, you know, um, um, uh, landmark studies, and it's on page 67 in the book. So and and then we had they give bits and pieces of information. Yeah, so we kind of told them the tidbits. We all, we yeah. took our direct mail and put it on TV. Yeah, I think and, the other important point you made was you did talk a little about um, Pablo Kurtz because I think uh, that goes into you know when you called and you figured out kind of what the process was so and where you fit into it. Yeah, so this goes back to the the list business now. So. Um, we had a list. The bottom, the, at that time, the boardroom reports list. You can imagine was going to be ha- affluent executives who were in business. So, and they bought by direct mail. So, the, everybody used the list. It was like you know, Money Magazine, Consumer Reports, a lot of catalogers, Forbes, Fortune, Wall Street Journal. Everybody used the list, right? It was a great list. Everybody knew the boardroom list. It was great. Plus, it wasn't a magazine. It was a newsletter, meaning that it didn't have advertising. People paid thirty bucks for it. Blah 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 blah. So I easy sale. So I was like the great salesman. I'm selling this list that everybody wants. So I thought, you know, who's not using this list and how am I going to get to those people? And so back, this is back like, you know, early 1980s. I didn't invent this, but the idea of decoying yourself to find out what the marketplace is doing right. is, is still prevalent today in, on steroids, on email. I mean, everybody should have, what, 30 or 40 email addresses so they can put an email in on every offer and watch their funnel. Right, yeah. Their, so I did this back in the 80s where I would subscribe to magazines. I would buy product from a catalog. I got to do it all on expense account, which was kind of cool. Um, and some of the stuff I would give away, like I'd subscribe to a magazine that wouldn't use our – I'd subscribe to a magazine like Money Magazine that would use our list, and then I'd see who's renting the Money Magazine list. And if there's anybody that's using that list and not ours, easy prospect. But then I took it a step further. I started getting on lists that I thought would be interesting prospects for us that I've already been prospecting. I got on their list and see who's renting their list to see if I could get, you know, second generation and start developing new categories. Catalogers, for example. I knew there were certain catalogers that could probably use our list because they were low ticket um, kind of opportunity seeker type catalogs. So I got on a couple of those lists. I bought a bunch of tchotchkes. I gave them away as gifts to people in the office to get on their list. Yeah. And then I would – I have to admit I did um, – there was one that was the uh, – it wasn't Victoria's Secret, but it was the equivalent to uh, – oh, God, I can't, I can't remember Playbook? the name. It was, it was like a – it was like kind of a se- – it wasn't sex toys, but it was uh, – it was, it was <laughs> like a little What did your wife of, say about that? She was okay with it. Oh. I, I got it at the office. It she didn't matter. <laughs> um, but I didn't get the sex toys themselves, but I got I, – right. I, I ordered something that was a little bit more tame, but I got on their list. And then I saw all the people using their list, and I found some information people that hadn't used our list before. So the reason why I called the Pablo Kurtz is that Pablo Kurtz was my decoy for Playboy magazine, which arrived in the office in a black sleeve, and people said, oh, he's buying Playboy on, on company time. Right. And meanwhile, there were people who it's were using the Playboy research. list. Market, market research, <laughs> um, but they were using the Playboy list. They were, you know, looking for affluent men on the Playboy list, but didn't wouldn't didn't know the boardroom reports list. Yeah. So I think that lesson of and and it, it's it's basically competitive advantage, right? It's it's understanding what the competition yeah. is doing, who their customers are, yeah. which customers you should have that you don't, yeah. and also. I think in email today, I'm finding that you, you can get a sense of what the funnel is when you buy a lot of product online. You don't get a lot of the intricacy of the – sometimes you can't see – there's a lot of stuff behind the curtain that you don't see as much, whereas it's a, in direct mail, it was a little bit more easy to see. Um, but I still think that – If you follow people through the funnel, I think you could still see the emails they're sending, the products, yeah. the follow-up, I mean everything right. that's You'll going see on. Right, you call you and, and you know it's a pain in the ass because you got to – um, you know, give away. Sometimes you want to give away your phone number to see what they'll do with it. If you and then see what kind of operator gets on the phone and see the mistakes they make, so that you can start thinking about elevating the bar. Right. Because that's about stealing smart. I don't want to steal from somebody who sucks. Right. right? I want to steal. Improve it. Yeah. I want to improve it. So you can also look for improvements in that funnel for how it fits for your business. Yeah. And another question is about. 
you know, obviously the big thing is you want to get response. And so I want to hear probably over the years you've built a good swipe file. What's some of your favorites, maybe uh, favorite copy from, from your personal swipe file? Yeah, I mean, there are, um, God, it's funny. This is like a real pet issue with me because I think that what I'm finding is the best online marketers today are really interested in seeing direct mail from the past. So um, I got to tell the story first. This is really funny. So one of the people in one of my mastermind groups, uh, I don't want to give away all the little details. So I'll just say he's in a foreign country. Okay. He's like a top marketer. Because I don't edit anything. So if you don't want it, don't. Yeah, no, don't but he, I'll, 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 keep it as, I'll keep it a little generic. Okay. But get, you'll get the gist. Okay. So he's in a foreign country doing email in a foreign language and his... Um, and, he, and he's teaching people how to do online marketing in, in a foreign country. So it's, so it's an information marketer. And his subject line is, do you make these mistakes in internet marketing or online marketing? And, I, and, he, and he sends a note and he says, this was like the highest open rate I've ever had in any email I've ever had. So I didn't want to be like the wise guy or the, I wasn't being the skunk at the picnic, believe me. I said, you're aware that there was a headline and I, I didn't look up the exact year but there was a guy named Max Sackheim, and I think I thought it was the 1950s, but Denny Hatch, who's a historian, thinks it might have been the 1930s, who had a, an ad for a foreign language program was hmm. that do you make these mistakes in English? And so I'm thinking to myself, holy moly, you know, that and still works. It still worked, and so um, just like what they don't want you to know. We were totally what they don't want you to know in all of our direct mail. You know, everybody's out to get you. Your accountant's trying to screw you. Your, your, your doctor is, 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 is making amputations by mistake. You know, everybody's trying to screw you. And um, you're, you know, we're going to protect you. You know, we're, you know, because we're, we're a consumer advocate of sorts in that, in that respect. That, that approach is like so all over everywhere now. And I'm not saying that Boardroom invented it, but we're close. We were one of the first to do that back in the 80s or even the 70s. So I guess the whole idea of swipe files, um, I mean, what they don't want you to know is a great concept. Mm -hmm. um, I think specificity and headlines, like the best ones I've ever seen, you know, um, we had the 10 cent cholesterol cure. It was one of my favorites, and it was a big control package for us. And it was basically, I don't know if that was aspirin or something. It was, it was some simple thing that you take around, around the house um, mm -hmm. as a cure. There was... Um, one of my favorites that we did once was um, why do how doctors never get sick even though they're hanging around. These aren't the exact words. Even though they're hanging around sick people all day. Um, but it was phrased much better than that. Big headline, big lift in response on something like that. And so then I, I just think that – and there are two, there are two sources, um, which I'll, I'll share with your, with your listeners, of, of the places to get some of the best swipe files. Not all free, unfortunately. Um, there's one guy that has um, his name is Lawrence Bernstein has a has a website. I think it's called. I have it bookmarked, so I always forget. I think it's the uh, information. Well, you know what? You do a follow up on this. Right? Yeah, so I'll I'll, give him, I'll I think it's uh, link the it up. Information um, information blog dot com info blog dot com something like that. So he's got like some old time direct mail on there for free, and then he's got a little bit of a paid product. Mm -hmm. The big one is something called who's mailing what dot com, and that's that's by Denny Hatch, who is an old time direct marketer, a really good friend, a mentor of mine. Um, that's a subscription model where you subscribe for something like a thousand bucks a year, and you get access to all these different mailing pieces. I think there's an opportunity there which I'm going to test out, and, I, and I've talked to Denny and his wife Peggy, who are, are the brain, ch brain children, uh, although they, they, they've been around a while, uh, of this product, and I just, I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a product for purchase there. You know, I could see an online market, and a high-priced product. I mean, there are online marketers that I know that would pay 10000 bucks for access to this database for, you know, that powerful? a lifetime yeah. database. I mean, almost like a lifetime subscription, but do it as a one-time purchase, um, that's going to pay for itself a hundred times over, over time. Right. And to have access to all of that, um, I'm just a huge believer. And again, I'm not a huge believer in just stealing. I'm a huge believer in stealing smart. And so variations, you know, human nature hasn't changed um, since the Paleozoic era or since the 1960s. And actually, 
because I grew I, I grew up in marketing in the '80s, I think that might as well be the Paleozoic era to some online marketers. That's why I call myself the dinosaur who won't give up, right? T Rex. Um, so I, I think that there's. Um, um, I'll give you a quick example too. The best one of the best books that I would recommend highly to anybody that we republish called Breakthrough Advertising by Gene Schwartz is probably the best book ever written on copy and creative. But you know what? It's not a book about copy and creative. It's a book about human nature mm -hmm. and how people, how you get people to buy. And interestingly, he wrote the book in 1966, and we haven't changed one word of that book from its original version. Wow. And it's 100% relevant today because it's really what makes people tick. So I'm really glad you brought up the whole concept of swipe files. And I could give you some more. We had a classic headline called Would Never Eat on an Airplane which was always well known as a boardroom headline. Um, I'll also tell you there are some great ones that we did for books uh, in the past, like these Book of Secrets. And we had one, How to Outwit a Mugger in a Self-Service Elevator was one of my favorites. How to what? Say How again? to Outwit a Mugger in a Self-Service Elevator, page 27. <laughs> um, there's another one, How do you know when a slot machine is ready to pay off? Um, that will get a lot of hits. That yeah. got a lot of hits. So, I mean, all these things, though, are just... You know, it's human, human nature. nature what, makes, yeah, what makes people tick? Yeah. It's usually greed. It's usually emotion. It's usually, um, you know, I, I kind of wish that in the health area, I, I do want to make it more about life and death. You know, it's funny. The financial people do better with scary headlines than the health people. Really? Um, people care more about their money, I think. Than, I, I don't think people have realized that if you're dead, you can't really spend it. But I don't know. So Just wait. Saying. So you know that's a good point, actually. How do you know how much to push the envelope? Like with the health headline, where you can make it life or death or somewhere in between. How do you know how much to it's push a it? Great question. You know, it's like pornography, right? You know when you see it. But <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that um, you know, for us, I'll tell you what the rule of thumb is. For us, you got to be able to back it up. I so you. if I'm going to tell you... Let's talk you, about one of the products. What's one good example from the site now that would be good to talk about? Um, you know, I don't know if it's on the site yet, but I mean, we have... Um, in fact, I have th this cancer book that we just launched. Um, it's an alternative cancer book, which I'm really, mm -hmm. really proud of because it, when I, I was diagnosed with prostate, stage 2 prostate cancer five years ago, and when I was diagnosed, um, I didn't know how I was going to attack it. And I found that there were just no easy places that were credible to get great information on alternative treatments. Because right. most cancer treatments, people go for traditional. For traditional, yeah. And if you're going to be stage three, stage four, most of those folks are going to be pushed towards another, another dose of, of chemotherapy or radiation, which to me, with a 1% survival rate, might not be the best alternative, there might be other things you might want to at least consider. I'm not saying better or worse, I'm just saying consider. Right. So I actually, we did this, um, uh, we did this piece just recently, and it, it says cancer cover-up, 382 shockingly effective but forbidden cures the cancer establishment doesn't want you to know. Yeah. I'd so buy it for sure. Yeah. Right, so we're, yeah. we're, it's, it's a book that you want to have on your shelf. Pull, now, hold it up for a second. Let me oh, see. Sure. Hold it, I mean, hold it up. Let me see. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. Okay. Uh, hard, hard to see, I guess, but cancer you know. cover. Okay. Um, but I, what, what, the reason why, I, and so you'd say cures. That's like that's over the top, right? So you know, going back to your question about what goes over the line, but forbidden cure, three effective, but are forbidden cures. I'm comfortable saying that because I know that some people have been cured by these, and they have been covered up, so that if I and I also know a, a statistic that a lot of the cures in this book or, or treatments uh, have, have close to a 10% survival rate where against radiation and chemo were 1%. Right. That's, 10, that's, 10, that's 10 times higher survival rate. Now, 10% doesn't sound like much either, right? Better but, than, uh, better than uh, exactly. the You're alternative. Exactly. You know. I mean, so to me, um, I think that there are people that I think as a matter of taste would say this goes over the top. Yeah. But for me, I know what's in the book. I know that if people aren't satisfied, it's, it's actually a free trial. They can get the book. If they think that we over-promised and under-delivered, free, they, they can send it back. We pay for the postage coming back. You know, it's not like, you know, so 
that's where that's my litmus test. But I'm not going to sit there and say, you know, under all circumstances, carrots can cure cancer. You know, I'm just not going to do right. that. Right. So that's obviously the other way. But you know what? You got to get people's attention. But the interesting thing is, I have another quote similar to the one about one dollar per thousand marketing needs five hundred dollar per thousand thinking. It's that the the least cluttered inbox is the one you grew up with if you're over 40 years old. You know, it's the one sitting on a post outside your house or it's the one right. in your apartment building. Yeah. And the fact is you have a, a less cluttered mailbox and if you can get the attention there, you know, we're expecting... That stands this, out. That looks good. Not only that, but if, we, if this book works, we're not going to get .0006 response rates. We, we could get, on a, on a bill me offer like this, we could get 4% response rates with a 60, 70% pay up. Wow. That's, you know, 3% net, on 75% pay up on 4% is a 3% net on a $40 product. You can make that work. <laughs> I have a question, two questions on that. One is I have to ask for one tip in that because now I'm like just really curious. What's one one thing in there that actually... Ugh, good, oh, no, <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to... You know, I'm going to have to send you the book, um, but I'll, let me just see if I can find one quickly. Um, um, I mean, okay, so zap cancer cells away. New research shows small electronic device operated by a 9-volt battery can help destroy cancer cells in your body. Hmm. According to a study at the University of Washington at Seattle, this futuristic gadget kills 42% of cancer cells after just 24 hours. The fa that doesn't mean you're going to get cured. It means that it's going to kill some cancer cells. Then. Right. Um, the fast-acting treatment is completely painless, takes just minutes, plus it's proven to work wonders for cancer. Professor Henry Lai, who conducted the test, projects that if we can reduce cancer by 42%, then we should be able to reduce it by 100%. If something as simple as this gadget can help you zap cancer away, then shouldn't you send for the book? The complete details begin on page 47. Mail the 30-day free preview card today. So, yeah. again, we're not saying that that's going to be the be-all, end-all, but... Certain things this... add up to helping you know, fight it, so to exactly. speak. And, and the other question I had is, you know, you kind of mentioned nonchalantly, I, you know, was diagnosed with stage two prostate cancer. And I actually think that's a fairly big deal. Um, how did you get through that while kind of managing work and life in general? What did you do to, to get, you know, to get through one of those, I guess, roadblocks in, in yeah. life? It's a good question. I, it's funny, you know, it, it took a while, I think, when we were just talking like pre-call or email, never came up, right? Yeah. And then I, I brought it up very nonchalantly. Yeah. And I think it's not because I'm trying to hide it. In fact, no, I don't I, think so. I'm, I'm proud of it. I actually have become sort of an advocate, um, not for any one treatment, but an advocate for education because I think there's a yeah. lot of data specifically on prostate cancer that is not good data uh, that you would just read if you went on yeah. various websites and stuff. So I'm very, very self-conscious about. So I guess what did you do that worked like mentally and maybe just physically or health-wise that, that got well, you through that? The first thing is I'm not going to, you know, you, you got to tell yourself you're not going to die. Um, so you have to have, you know, obviously the, the, all the books will tell you positive attitude and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that I think was helpful for me, and it's very. This is kind of very personal. Is that um, I knew because of the material that I had been working with my whole career at Boardroom at Bottom Line that I was going to find out everything, and I was going to end up with the best treatment, with the best education, with the best. You know, if it was there was going to be a way to beat it, I'm going to find the best way to do it. So by by um, by embedding myself in a uh, in an inquiry of of insatiable curiosity about the disease called prostate cancer, it kind of took away from you know sitting there saying you know woe is me why me all that kind of right. crap. Um, also, I think that I you know there's that old story and I read a lot of stories about you know people who survive horrific car accidents and are paralyzed in particular. And as a chiropractor, I'm, you know I'm sure that you know, you probably are very, very sensitive to that type of thing. And almost to every single one of them that survives or they always have, it's always this, it's very similar where they say, you know what? I was spared. So there must be some other reason. Now, some mm -hmm. people say it was God's reason, whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't matter. But there's some reason why I was spared and shouldn't there be a bigger purpose? Now, mm -hmm. the good news for me was that I was already into kind of a bigger purpose, which was good. Uh, in that I was always into this idea of contribution before anything else. 
um, you know that you know I think the word networking is so overused that I think you have to contribute to people that's how you connect with them mm -hmm. and networking is just sort of the byproduct you know having a lot of friends on Facebook is not networking contributing to people's lives and you know if I could give to your audience uh, things that um, you know are uh, you know incredible uh, useful things that's so important to me so I was already there on the contribution phase mm. I think what the when I was diagnosed I think all of a sudden my mind took that even to a higher level it's like okay what's the next level yeah. of contribution well I'm gonna now gonna give money to prostate cancer research for the rest of my life um, I'm gonna um, make sure that I will not that I will if I survive but when I get through everything that I'm going to be the person that people can go to to run ideas by. Because yeah. I went through a really incredible process. Like one of the big things that I really, and I would say this to anybody who would be diagnosed with any disease and that, that might require surgery, might not, might require different treatments, go talk to somebody who's incredibly knowledgeable who doesn't have a dog in the fight, which is true in almost anything in business. Like go to a yeah. consultant who doesn't have any, they don't have any stake or interest, no stake. but they'll just give you their honest opinion on but it. But they have yeah. to be knowledgeable. Yeah. So, the diff so for me, it was going to an oncologist who had no skin in the game. Here's my – I basically paid him almost like a shrink. I paid him for an hour of his time, and I gave him my charts. I went in there, and I said, you're not examining my prostate. You're not – here's my numbers. Here's what I think. Yeah. Tell me what to do because I went to the radiologist. He said I should have radiation. Surprise! You're getting the surgeon. Yeah. Have surgery. I went to the uh, to the um, to the healer, and they said, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna do this through you know through uh, you know natural potions." <laughs> um, so you know, right? So that, so just that alone. So I think when I realized that I was gonna sort of be a messenger of information based on the on the research I did, so that my res it's sort of like when you when you teach a full semester of college, which I did once. It's the second time you teach it, it's easier because you already did the syllabus, right? Right. Of course, I'm stupid. I didn't do it a second time. And then by the time I was ready to do it again, I'd have to redo the syllabus because the internet came along. So, you know, but I think that, you know, I didn't want any of that research to go to waste. Just like all my list stuff, right? All that list mastery. Like, I don't want that to go to waste. I want that right. to be it useful. It applies right to the online world exactly. and websites. Not 100% maybe, but. But, I mean, this goes into the, the other question I had, which is. Um, when I, I was, we were talking about walking through a typical day and I think it goes into, you know, being diagnosed with prostate cancer and one of your daily routines. Can you tell people what you do? Yeah, there's uh, a book. I don't know if you can, I guess you can get it somewhere. It's called the five minute journal, but you mm -hmm. don't even need the whole journal. It's uh it's got some prompts in it. Mm -hmm. And the first prompt in the five minute journal every morning, it's, I am grateful for dot, dot, dot. And you write down three things. Yeah. So every single day. I force myself, and this is after I eat breakfast, which you have to eat breakfast, and after I take my supplements, which you should take the right supplements. Um, but the first thing I do is I write down those three things that I'm grateful for that day. And there's some repetition day to day sometimes. Yeah. Um, some days it comes up my wife and my kids, and some days it comes up I'm grateful for, I think today, because I knew I was doing this interview, one of the things I'm grateful for is the ability to share with a new network, yeah. right? You gave me that privilege. I'm grateful for you. Um, it's an honor I'm to have you here. I'm grateful for Jeremy. So I, I think that um, that and then the other piece of that at the end of the day, and I can walk, I don't, I don't have to walk you through the whole day because that. No, can, I'm just curious everything. because sometimes, you know, when it's mediocre days or okay days, what about on a tough day? How do you right. do that? So then the end of the day, very important. This is a Dan Sullivan concept. Dan Sullivan is the guy who is the head of strategic coach and he's probably the top coach for entrepreneurs on, uh, in the world and he's the, he's awesome he's just you know written books i recommend him highly i'm in one of his groups um whatever N not a commercial i think he has all. one of the one of his groups comes through chicago i believe yeah he does chicago yeah. and toronto those yeah. are his two spots i go to toronto next week yeah so um if i did chicago we could get together that's so, right yeah so um what 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 Dan always says is that you want to every day you want to write down three wins, three wins every day. Um, in fact, there's an app that's free. It's called <laughs> there's an app called Win Streak. So you force yourself on your smartphone. I, I do it on paper. I like the idea of writing. Yeah. Personally, but you can do it on your on your smartphone. 
and it's called win streak, and you write down your three wins every day. So using the example you just gave, you know, having the worst day, I mean, I was asked at a conference because I had shared this with some people in a public group of about 100 people. The, the head of the conference asked me to stand up and say, you know, Brian, I heard that you had three wins even on a really tough day because we were talking about the concept of three wins. No matter mm -hmm. how bad your day is, you're going to have three things that are wins. And it, mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you write down those three wins, you don't think about what you could have done better. You don't think about what went wrong. Three wins. Just the wins. Period. Just yeah. the wins. And so I, did, I had three wins the day, this past April. My father-in-law died. Oh. He had a massive stroke. We wow. ran to Florida. He was gone in two days. I was sitting with him in hospice. I mean, it was like that, yeah, unexpected, horrible. completely. Sorry. It, was all, it was terrible. Great mentor of mine, another, another business entrepreneur. Um, and after he died at some point during that day or that night, I remember writing down three wins on that day. Because I said to myself, you know, this guy just left an incredible legacy, mm -hmm. you know, to, to my wife and to, my, to his grandchildren and and... They were incredible wins that day. I mean, it, it sucked, you know, watching somebody die in front of you. Um, of course, yeah. And yet I was still able to get three wins out of that. If I can get three wins that day, anybody can get three wins any day. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, we do get sort of hung up on the – and so as an entrepreneur, you know, to bring it back to, to business and, and what you do every day, there's going to be those ups and downs, right? And so – as an entrepreneur, it, when you do the, I think with an entrepreneur, I think you really have to write down not only what you're grateful for, but probably the next couple of things you have to write down is what's going to make today great. And you want to put down three big things that you want to get done that day. Because like most entrepreneurs, we're all shiny object people. We're all going yeah. after something and you're going to get distracted. Right. So it's more than just a to-do list. Yeah. Write down, and three is a good number. Every, three is a good number for almost anything. You know, th what I'm grateful for, three things. What I want to get accomplished today, three things, boom, big, big things I want to get accomplished today. Then, you know, three, then, then there's another one in that, in that five-minute journal. It's just I am dot, dot, dot. And you write three things that you are that day. You know, today I am list guy from the 1980s coming back to to to, to haunt a bunch of internet <laughs> marketers or whatever but whatever you are and and right. you want to make that powerful you don't yeah. want to say you know i am a schlep you know <laughs> i feel like i can talk to you for the next five hours but i'm gonna i have um okay i want to hear more about um just tell tell us about boardroom inc what's going on what's exciting then i have one last or actually one and a half questions for you okay uh, and I hope this ends up being really valuable for your folks. Okay, I, you know, because we've been off on a couple of tangents on some personal They're stuff. They're good but tangents. I, but I think they, They're yeah, important. okay, because you know your audience best, and, you know, I want to serve them. And I think we'll, we'll talk about offline afterwards, I'll talk about the content I have, and I'd like to get your people, like, a piece of content that I have that is so directed to what they do, all right? Sure. Because I really want to deliver as much yeah. as I can for you if I didn't deliver it in this interview. For sure. Um, so now I just forgot. So what's, oh, so, um, yeah, oh, what's boardroom. new and so exciting? So boardroom, um, obviously, or what you know, you're working uh, on or boardroom or both. So I think, you know, I'm, I, I am a believer in, you know, when everybody's going right, it's a good time to go left. And so the contrarian view that since we're so good at direct mail, remember, know everything about this much, we are the best at direct mail. I mean, even though it's smaller than it was and it's not as big a business as it was for, because of costs and list availability and all of that, I can give you all the excuses why people will say direct mail's dead. Right. Um, it's not dead. There's going to be all kinds of different uses for it, three-dimensional mailings, all the things we've already talked about. But I think that this idea that everybody's going right, go left, I think what's happened at Boardroom is that we realize that we're so good at this, at that, at that area, that we're on the hunt and I can basically put it out there to your to your folks for really great online product that has physical product or can easily be turned into DVDs or something really powerful physical that might have some legs in the direct mail world. And specifically, if it's got legs to a 50 or 60 plus audience, an older demographic, affluent demographic, I'm the perfect person to go to because I got a 9 million name database. I have direct mail expertise. You may get um, flooded well, with emails. Are you I sure might, you want to do you know, this? That's okay. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. Um, in fact, I'll give an email uh, at the end that they can send it to. You know, it's not my prime, but I'll, I'll, this way I can isolate. Pablo. No, I don't do no, Pablo. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, Pablo. Send it to Pablo Kurtz. I'll give you that email later at the end. But um, basically, 
Um, Nine million name database. I kind of would recognize if it's a product, possibly that would that would play well to our audience. And then the idea would be that I'd be willing to invest in that, and then the entrepreneur would have to just get a royalty. You know, right. not a huge royalty, but no expense. No. So that has been a big initiative, and we're that cancer book, the the one that I mentioned, was basically a digital book for the most part. They, they was a physical product somewhere, but they were giving it away mostly as a, as a premium to a membership site. Mm-hmm. And when I went to the guy who owns the company and I said, I think this book could stand on its own as a direct mail product. That's how the project started. The weight loss supplement that I mentioned, totally online. And I said, you know what? The way this is positioned to a little bit older audience that it's got the double blind studies. It's got incredible testimonials. It's not, it's, it's not, marketed as a panacea, like a magic pill that you're going to lose weight. Everything about this particular product, the way it was marketed, the way it was developed, took a year to develop with double blind studies. Now I'm thinking, got the credibility, I got all the, there are a lot of elements I look for. All those pieces are in place. All those criteria. So that's a big thing going on at Boardroom. On the online side, we're kind of um, much more in a, what I call an Agora model, A-G-O-R-A. They're a major uh, publisher in Baltimore, and I love giving them the props for this because they're one of the first companies that really understood the idea of developing an editorial e-letter, and they didn't even think it was going to have advertising. In fact, the first one, it was called The Daily Reckoning, and it was written by the founder of Agora. His name is Bill Bonner, who's a wonderful copywriter as well, and he was writing it from Europe for the most part, and he was writing this e-letter that was basically like his view on what was happening on Wall Street and the stock market and investment. And then eventually someone in his company, and he, had, he ended up like with friends and family, and then it got a little bigger. And all of a sudden he had 30,000 subscribers. And someone said, hey, Bill, you know, maybe we could sell some product to these people. And so then he started finding other investment product to sell. One thing led to another. And Agora is like through the roof as far as their online marketing. They're, they're a company to, to look at very closely because they came from direct mail too. So their copy is brilliant. I mean, they do some of the best. I don't know if anybody on your call has ever seen the end of the world, the end of America video sales letter, which is for the Stansberry Research letter. That's an Agora product, Mm. and it's probably the best video sales letter that I've ever seen. Uh, It's one of the most successful anyway. And so anyway, I guess my – so at Boardroom, we followed that model, and we have some great e-letters. We have, you know, close to a million e-letter subscribers. We do run advertising in those as opposed to the print publications where we don't. And we're trying to figure out other ways to do e-commerce, and it's hard. You know, it's hard to to turn that boat of a legacy print business into an Internet business. Um, I think we've done pretty well. I think we have a ways to go, and we're working really hard at it. We think we could be in a bigger e-commerce business. Um, all of our experts and all the products that we recommend in our publications. I think Jay Abraham, the great marketing guru, would say that you know his book is one of my favorites that I've ever read, which is get everything you can out of everything you got. So if someone's going to buy um, a particular book from one of our authors, why not buy it through us and us get a percentage? We never thought like that. Mm-hmm. That wasn't our model. But I think online you have to think like that. So, so that's a lot people- of what's going on. Where can people find out more? Where they should, what uh, website should they go to? Um, BottomlinePublications.com. Okay. Um, they could get to anything there. They can they can subscribe to any of our e-letters. Uh, we have a health one. We have a general consumer one. We have a, a household tips one. We have some really neat e-letters. Um, they do have advertising in them, but they have good editorial using the Agora model. See, so Agora model is not just sending ads to people. It's it's sending real content, which the yeah. magazine people don't get still. They don't get the fact that if they if they actually the marketing people talk to their editorial people, they could probably deliver some really good e newsletter content, and they'd probably be able to sell more subscriptions that way. Yeah, just and, saying. And Brian, you've been really generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I have to ask before we end uh, a memorable umpire story. Yeah, and actually, um, I yeah. need to know your best. Uh, what you think the headline for this interview should be when we publish it, because you're the expert. Yeah, I, I thought about that. The one that I wrote down, uh, we'll do that after. The one I wrote down, I don't think it's that great. I'm going to read it after I'm done, and then maybe I'll make up a new one. As we're, It'll come to me right when I'm talking to you. Yeah. You inspire me. You have a very inspired you, – you should, you should call your interviews. You should use the word inspire. Oh, you do? Use inspired the word. insider. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, you funny. really have inspired me quite a bit today. 
Thank you. Because uh, I thought about a lot of new things today as I'm talking to you. I think you'll learn by teaching. So, um, so anyway, umpire stories. So there are two quick ones. One is in a high school game, um, there was once a, a play. Um, I was on the bases, and I was making a call at third base, and the bases had been loaded, and the balls were being r- thrown around, and there were two guys standing on the base, two runners standing on third base, and then the ball got thrown and it was it was trickling away I lost sight of the ball and I called timeout now in baseball if you call a timeout it's like calling a foul ball once you call it it's done you cannot reverse that call hmm. in other words um, if you and I'll get it, it, it was once a Little League World Series game where a ball was trickling down the third baseline and stupidly the third base umpire behind the bag not his call called it a foul ball before it got to the bag of course the ball trickles hits the bag which means it's a fair ball and the ball had to remain a foul ball because he killed it in a timeout same thing so I killed it I killed the play because I lost sight of the ball and the ball was like right there it was pretty close so now I had to put runners back where I thought they would be. And the lesson, of course, is like don't call timeout too soon. And I think you could take that lesson and it, it's the idea of keeping the idea, you know, let's, let's put it in a business context. Keep the ball in the air. You know, when you're brainstorming, don't cut off ideas. So there, I, I walked away. I got, I, got, I got the crap beat out of me that day by calling the inadvertent timeout because I was stuck with my timeout. And I had to figure out how to. And the other one just happened this summer, where in Little League baseball, 12 year old and, and younger, you cannot slide head first. I didn't know so, that. Right. So you can slide feet first only, but if you're going back to a base, you can slide head first. So if you round third base coming home and then you go try to go back to third when you decide you're not going to make it, you can go head first back. I gotcha. into okay. So I have a play. This is, this is I, I, was, I had the privilege of being on ESPN. Uh, for the Mid-Atlantic Championship um, this past summer. Um, this was the game before that, but it was the same team, and so I had to do them again. And a kid comes rounding third. He's, he's coming home, and there's no throw to the catcher, and the kid slides head first. And I'm sitting there. He's completely safe, and I'm like, he's out for sliding head first. And they're getting ready to try to argue with me, and they know they can't because they know what the rule is. And it was the and the kid is upset. No yeah. one's yell, No one's really yelling at me. They tried to make the case that the kid tripped. He didn't trip. He he slid head first. And so it was one of those calls that you know I don't regret because I made the right call. I made a 12 year old cry. Nice made, work. <laughs> yeah. I, it was it was a major game. I mean, this is like you know it was the District of Columbia it's yeah. state champion. Two 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 state champions at a mid Atlantic at a mid Atlantic regional. For Little League, winner winner of that regional goes to Williamsport to the World Series. D.C. against Pennsylvania. That's a tough call. Tough call. Actually. And and I was like, so again on that one, lesson: stick to your convictions. You know you're right. I I knew I was right. Those are the rules. And I guess I'm so flexible in my business life that I think it's a good discipline sometimes to know that there are rules. And it probably would help me a little bit in some negotiations when I give up too much in a negotiation to kind of be a little tougher and to stick by my guns. Yeah. So I was very proud of myself for being able to make that call, and I didn't hesitate, and I just did it. Yeah. So very, just an interesting kind of thing. For sure. So give me your what you think right yeah, now. What did I write here? The work in progress best headline. Yeah, there was a lot in your in your questions that we talked about you know, your first sale and your next sale and all that. So I wrote down, it's not, it's, it's not about, I don't know if it's not about your first sale. It's not about your next sale. How about 387 secrets, what you don't know? No. Yeah, what, what, what you're not supposed <laughs> well, what, to know about selling, right? Um, it's not about your next sale. It's about how you contribute and connect first. It's something like that. Or, or that, you know, selling, selling is not, Selling is, this is a Joe Polish thing, you know, who's a great marketer. Selling is not evil, but, but selling is about relationship. So maybe that's it. Maybe is, you know, selling, I'm trying to get it as, I'm, I'm trying to let you inspire me. But, you know, real selling is, is real relationship, you know, a real relationship building. And if that, that would be like a big message for me to get out, that if everybody saw selling as something that, you know, Marty... Edelston, who, again, my fa- our founder, used to always say, you know, make it easy for the customer to buy. And, you know, while he was a very aggressive sales guy 
and he would write you notes until you said yes. It was almost like he'd you know, put your arm behind your back until you said uncle, uh, until he got the sale. There is no no. There was a part of him that was incredibly um, dedicated to making sure that he was taking care of you first. Yeah. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just customer first or something like that. I don't know. It's, it's, It'll it's be a in work there in progress. Somewhere. I figured I'd have to ask you that question because, you know, because of the nature of what you do. So, yeah. Yeah. I but. mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely that, you know, you know, selling is, is not about, you know, wringing every dime out of the customer, you know, right. it's just, it's just so much bigger than that. It's just yeah. so much. Bigger than that. Well, Brian, I want to be the first one to thank you so much. Everyone should check out the site. And do you want to share your email for people? Yeah, can... so I'm going to do two things. I'll, we're going to, I'm going to set up a, a page that will be um, www.briankurtz.me slash inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, and I'll put something up there that will be of incredible value, which you and I are going to decide um, what would be best for your audience. Um, so that's briankurtz.me slash inspired. Is it you think inspired or inspire? Inspired, oh. inspired goods. Inspired. Yeah. Um, and then um, the email um, that they could send to is is a good one to remember. It's T Rex as the dinosaur, cowboy, which are the cowboys. The number one at gmail dot com. So okay. it's T Rex cowboy one. I couldn't get T Rex cowboy. T Rex cowboy one at gmail dot com. And if they want to send me any specific, I usually don't give out my uh, any email. Yeah. I, I'd rather them go to the squeeze page and then I communicate For through sure. there because I'm going to create a blog at some point. And I'm going to create yeah. a lot of content uh, over time. We'll, send, but we'll link up audience, that also. And, yeah, uh, and we'll put all that up. But I yeah. think if they have an idea for you know a product, I'll read them. I, 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 I promise to read yeah. them. It's You're not quick. the email I check first, but I will read them. Yeah. Well, Brent, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Absolutely. Okay.